You've probably gone through the video where we've now started dealing with uh, changes in altitude, the differences of the initial launching point vertically from where it lands. The next step is we're going to go ahead and look at how trigonometry can let us go ahead and start dealing with different angles. Okay, So rather than shooting it straight vertically or straight horizontally, we're going to go ahead and shoot it off at an angle of 75 degrees from the horizon. Okay. Now, in terms of our calculations, okay, we're going to be looking at a lot of the same concepts. Okay? But we're going to have to, again, keep track of where the different values belong. Okay? And in this case, we're going to have to deal with a longer version of the same equation that we started off with from when we knew there was straight horizontal movement. So, information is pretty much the same. Okay? We need to know about our distance. Okay? We're going to have to be very conscious of how we choose that. So our initial distance versus the total distance, where it ends up. We're going to have to keep track of the um, vertical information. Okay. The initial velocity okay, is actually going to matter in this case because before it was zero because shooting horizontally doesn't mean that it's going up. Whereas in this case, we know that it will be moving upwards. And we're going to have to keep track of time. And we need to recognize that we have the acceleration due to gravity, the acceleration, okay, negative 9.82 meters per second squared, and how that's going to get multiplied by time. Okay, So that's a couple of the equations that you've already seen. But again, we, this time we need to be mindful of our angle and how we've worked in terms of trigonometry. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at our information. Okay, We know that distance is that vertical change. We know that we're going to go from our initial distance of 0 meters down 10 meters. So our total distance traveled uh, effectively is 10 meters. Our velocity okay, of the cannon itself is 15 meters per second. Okay. But we need to go ahead and figure out the initial velo uh, velocity. Okay. And this is where we go ahead and think about our trigonometry. Okay. So we know that the angle is going to be 75 degrees. Okay. But we need to remember that Sokoto is going to help us out. Okay. Okay. So, so sine of the angle is going to be equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. Okay? And in this case, the hypotenuse, okay, that initial velocity, is that 15 meters per second. Okay? And the opposite is basically our vertical value. And we know that later on, when we need to figure out our x distance, our horizontal distance, that's where the cosine of our theta is going to be equal to the adjacent line over the hypotenuse. Okay. So when we rearrange these, hypotenuse times cosine theta is the adjacent, or hypotenuse of the sine theta equals the opposite. So our velocity initial vertical velocity is basically 15 meters per second times sine of 75 degrees. Okay. Now that leaves us with two more things that we need to know. Okay. We know that we have a acceleration okay, equal to gravity which is negative 9.82 meters per second squared, and we have an unknown time value. Okay. So that's something that we're going to have to figure out. So moving forward with our equation, we know that d equals the initial distance plus the initial velocity times time plus one half of our acceleration due to gravity times time squared. Unlike the past equation where we shot it off horizontally, okay, 
this is where we need to go ahead and recognize that the di value okay, may still be a zero, okay, but we're going to leave that in there as we set this up because our total distance traveled is that negative 10 meters plus our initial velocity of the 15 meters per second times sine 75 degrees times time plus one half negative 9.82 meters per second squared times time squared. So what you may kind of recognize, okay, we have two values of time and one of them is with an exponential rise. Okay? That can be an issue, okay, because this is where we have to work with what you may remember from your math classes, quadratic equations. Okay? So what I'm going to recommend that you do is we need to start setting it up as a quadratic equation. So one of the first things about that is we need to make sure that that 10 meters okay, gets moved over and we set this equation equal to zero. So the first thing is um, I'm going to do two things. One is we're going to move that over. Secondly, we're going to get it in the proper order because the traditional order for a, a quadratic equation is equal zero equals um, ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay, so we need to kind of flip the equation around. So for us, zero equals one half times negative nine point eight two meters per second squared times t squared plus 15 sine 45 degrees sorry 75 degrees times time plus okay and moving negative 10 meters over we're adding 10 meters to both sides, so this becomes 10 meters. With that equation, okay, we're able to go ahead and say that A is going to be equal to the 1 half of negative 9.82 meters per second squared. Okay. Okay. B is going to be equal to 15 sine of 75 degrees okay? and C is equal to 10. And that information goes ahead and allows us to go ahead and use the uh, way to solve that. So X equals, okay, or in this case, let's go ahead and just clear that out. In this case, T equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Okay. This is where the calculations get a little tricky because we've got a plus or minus value. So we'll actually have to run this in the calculator two times. So let's go ahead and open up the calculator and clean up these values. Um, so we don't have to constantly be keeping track of all that information. One half times negative 9.82 is going to be negative 4.91. So negative 4.91 equals A. We can go ahead and do the trigonometry portion. So 15 times the sine of 75 degrees okay. and if I hit alpha enter that gives me a more decimal number okay. so equals 14.4889 okay. and 10 is going to remain 10 so 
Okay, and remember, we're going to have to go ahead and run the quadratic equation two times. So what we'll do is t equals negative 14.4889 plus or minus square root of 14.889 squared minus 4 times a, so negative 4.91 times 10. With that entire string, over 2 times a. And I'm going to really emphasize, make sure you're keeping track of the signs. Don't remove those, don't eliminate them, because that can make a lot of errors show up in the calculations. So entering this in the calculator, t equals open parentheses negative 14.4889 and we'll start off with addition of the square root fourteen point four eight eight nine squared so raised to the two minus four times negative four point nine one times ten close the parenthesis for the square root close the parenthesis for the top divide by open parenthesis for the bottom 2 times 4.91. So we hit enter, okay, and we get a value of point. Oh, and I forgot my. Let's go ahead and fix that, okay? Keep track of the negative signs. It's easy to go ahead and misplace those. The initial time is negative 5, sorry, negative. So the initial time. is equal to negative point five seven seven three. Now a negative time is not going to be too useful for what we're looking at, okay? But it's not something we want to throw away. So basically if the full per, um, parabolic movement was being measured, okay, that's when it would have been starting at the ground to get the same information. Okay. So the second part of the equation, okay, and this is why it's nice to do it in graph and calculator or something that you can go ahead and just change, we're now subtracting the square root rather than adding it. And in this case, that tells us that time equals, okay, the other option of time, equals 3.5 seconds for both of those okay that time is a little bit more realistic it's a positive value and we can then use that to go in junction with our velocity measurement okay. so for our velocity measurement we need to go back at some of our initial data okay scroll way back up here and we talked about using the cosine value okay so our cosine value okay, tells us our x, our horizontal velocity, okay? whereas the sine information was basically telling us our vertical velocity. Okay? So for us to go forward, okay, we're now looking at the equation of our average velocity okay, times, or it's going to be equal to our change in distance over our change in time. Okay? We know our change in time. Okay? So our change in time is that 3.528 seconds okay? 
our distance is the unknown, okay? But our velocity, okay? And this is where we need to remember that our velocity of the cannon was 15 meters per second, okay? Our velocity initial, okay, in this case, of our horizontal is going to be equal to 15 meters per second times cosine of our 75 degree angle. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and just multiply our 15 meters per second times cosine of 75 degrees times 3.528 seconds. Okay, seconds will go ahead and cancel out, leaving us with meters. And when we go ahead and bring up the calculator, we'll just multiply the 3.52816, the, the calculator answer, since we hate rounding off before we need to, times. And here we'll go ahead and just to put in 15 times second cosine of 75 degrees, close parenthesis, alpha enter to go ahead and let it do the decimal work. And that's basically telling us that it should land at 13.697 meters. Okay. So when we go back into our, cal or our uh, simulator, we should be able to go ahead and leave it at the 10 meters vertical gain above the ground, okay, times 75. And we're saying that this should land at 13.7, basically. We'll fire the cannon. We may need to zoom out, okay. But we can see that all of our calculations checked out, okay? 3.53 seconds. We know that the uh, cannonball landed at 13.41 or 71 meters. Okay, slight variations, and I think that's part of just how it addresses the location of the cannon. So I know those calculations were definitely a, a, a <laughs> big hurdle to go ahead and uh, get past a lot of them. But knowing how to work with those quadratic equations, knowing how to use the trigonometry, and knowing how to use the formula sheets gives you a lot of tools available to solve a lot of problems. And as I've mentioned in class before, you know, I use that formula sheet on projects outside of just class. Um, it's a great resource. It's a great way of knowing how to use those tools. And a lot of it does tell you a lot of that information. Probably the only thing um, out of this lesson that was not directly in the other uh, formula sheets is it does not provide you with how to solve those quadratic equations. So that is something where you do need to pay attention to your math classes when you see that, um, whether you've seen that already or if you just know that it's out there. Um, but again, a lot of math uh, is involved in engineering, but a lot of that's involved in real life too. Um, so while you may not be firing a cannon, um, it's definitely uh, good to recognize how to take care of these formulas, keeping track of your negative signs, keeping track of the information that you need versus the information that you have, and then being able to go ahead and piece it all together to uh, use multiple equations to solve larger problems. So hopefully you, uh, you enjoyed that little extra challenge, um, but that's not something that's going to be expected on the test. So, so best of luck, and uh, hopefully you can have some more fun with the uh, projectile motion simulator.